so I'll start now the recording and uh, share the screen. Uh, okay, and now uh, I go here. And you should be able to see now the, uh, the PowerPoint uh, page. Okay, from the beginning slide. Okay, so Marcel Breuer, he was the professor, uh, the teacher at Harvard uh, for, for John Johansson, and of course, not just for him, but they were very connected. And I think Breuer influenced him to a certain extent, and I will explain in what way. So as you know, Breuer was uh, formed by at the Bauhaus, and uh, he became an instructor there. Walter Gropius had a lot of uh, confidence in Marcel Breuer. Breuer was born in, in Hungary, and uh, when uh, the Bauhaus dissolved and uh, Walter Gropius uh, crossed the ocean, well, first they went to England, and then they went to um, to the United States. And, and Gropius, who in this picture is on the left, uh, became the, the dean or the director of the Department of Architecture at Harvard. And he also promoted Marcel Breuer, who is um, uh, standing up. So um, here, uh, you know, in older age, uh, and ex here he was very young, uh, still at the Bauhaus, a uh, uh, brilliant uh, designer and uh, later on a brilliant architect. This is Marcel Breuer, one of the stars of the Bauhaus. And this, is a, uh, this was a school and a movement that still moved me uh, because of their ac accomplishment and their ability to, to promote talent of the highest order. Here he is young at the Bauhaus in his famous Vasily chair, or also known the Kandinsky chair. That's because uh, Marcel Breuer uh, manufactured the chair for Kandinsky, who was his colleague in the faculty at, Bauha at the Bauhaus, uh, just for him. And later on by an Italian manufacturer, this famous chair became known as, uh, I mean, he, that, that manufacturer named it the Vasily chair. Initially was named uh, with some letters and numbers. Anyway, uh, I like this oxymoronic um, formulation or expression, uh, the invention of the heavy lightness. Heavy lightness indeed. This is a library, but we'll come back to it, uh, built in the United States. Very inter interesting structure, uh, sculptural and also uh, almost logical. Um, and uh, Tyan Modernist Homes by Marcel Breuer that will leave you with a bad case of house envy. And maybe the house envy will uh, return when we talk about the houses built by John Johansson. Uh, this is uh, also John Johansson built in, in, uh, in, the, in New Canaan in Connecticut uh, a few years later in the 50s, but Breuer built uh, in the late 40s. So these are modernist architects, so to speak, but there was a, a side of modernism which I like very much, optimistic, uh, adventurous, uh, without inhibitions. There was something very fresh, and of course it was after the Second World War, and, but, but uh, I, I, I have a nostalgia for this, this modernism, because I think we are kind of tired, yes, we explore all kinds of things, but that that fresh modernism after the war is uh, is is uh, is still very appealing to me, and to other people as well. Anyway, he built many houses. Breuer, I don't insist too much because this is mo mo mostly an introduction to John Johansson, uh, and to see the connection with Johansson. Although the, Johansson was different and in in many respects, but there is a connection. The Gropius House in Lincoln, Massachusetts built uh, before the war, actually, also in a modernist language. The, these Europeans brought modernism uh, to the United States, a certain kind of modernism, you know, European modernism. Uh, the United States had its own modernity in, 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 to an extent, but different than the European one. So this was Gropius House. Uh, of course, they were able to build even for themselves. They had many commissions. They were doing well. And there was a sense of optimism, especially after the war, um, when the world restarted to, um, you know, to live, so to speak. 
another house by uh, Breuer. Um, I go quickly because uh, it's, a, it's a large, um, a large uh, presentation just on him because he built a lot. Um, now here, and this is important, I think, to remark, you see Walter Gropius, uh, um, Marcel Breuer, uh, in fact, more than Walter Gropius, was not afraid to use even natural materials, you know, like rough. That's why maybe, you know, uh, a reference to his work as a, about, um, you know, heavy lightness uh, or light heaviness, if you want. He used stones. And, and uh, Johansson does too, even in association with plastic, with, with artificial materials. And this duality, I think, I think is interesting. You see, the, the, there is wood here, there is stone, and uh, a primal uh, force have these buildings, although they are uh, modernist buildings. Another house, um, well, uh, there were two houses with the same name, but this is the second one that was built and very different from the first one. Unfortunately, the, the pictures do not have an excellent resolution and I, I ask for forgiveness. Um, okay. They experimented a lot. They also used, uh, you know, concrete uh, a, a lot. And there was a belief in, in, in concrete at that time. It's incredible how many houses and innovative houses uh, they, they built. You know. It seems uh, the United States was ready to receive these Europeans and commission them uh, on a large scale, so to speak. Uh, this, this early modernism is very fresh for me and, and uh, uh, it's so different from our modernity in a way. In a way, they invented everything, uh, and we are just repeating somehow some of the themes, um, you know, they addressed. Now, this was the Museum of Modern Art exhibition in what year, 1948, so immediately after the war, and he built this, um, you know, a show, uh, I mean, this exhibition house in the, uh, in the backyard uh, of, 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 the, of the museum. Uh, cottage. Uh, of course, uh, there is European modernism, but also there is the beauty of the, the American landscape. Uh, so it's an interesting uh, dialogue between the two. Another house, and we'll see the relationship somehow with the, with the houses by uh, John Johansson. But as opposed to John Johansson, uh, the houses built by Marcel Breuer were not demolished. In, the, in this respect, John Johansson was very uh, unlucky. I mean, 10 of his buildings have been destroyed and even large and important structures. It's incredible. Maybe because somehow uh, the United States doesn't appreciate or didn't appreciate very much what, what was called uh, brutalism, but uh, he was not really, I mean, there was a <laughs> so-called touch of brutalism, but it was not a very brutal brutalism, if I can say so. Anyway, we'll arrive there. Another house, um, one in Switzerland, uh, closer to us in time. Um, again, you know, the, this courage to, 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 to bring together uh, various textures and, and, and even materials. An uninhibited modernism, if I can say so. And, 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 and these are not minimalist houses. Uh, there is a richness about them that, that transcends uh, minimalism. A house in, uh, in France. Now, uh, don't know very well why I show this now. It's uh, the, the, you know the early work of, of Gro Gropius and and, uh, and 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 Breuer together at the Bauhaus, and this house still exists, but it was uh, you know trans changed a little bit and refurbished. Uh, it looks like this now. Then the uh, well-known Whitney Museum in New York, which was also the work of uh, Marcel Breuer. 
a famous work, uh, you know, in an important part of the city. Uh, and it's a good museum. There is Mr. Breuer behind that, uh, you know, uh, sculptural window. And here he is again. So they, they love monumentality. There was a sculptural quality to their work. And uh, I think uh, Johansson, uh, uh, you know, was in good hands, so to speak. You know, if you have such a professor, you, know, you are encouraged to work somehow in the same spirit. Uh, monastery, also very interesting. Um, you know, uh, he built uh, another one. Uh, I, I think the way he worked with concrete, you know, where there is architecture, there is also sculpture. Uh, it's, it's very fine work. It was an exciting, exciting time for, for architecture, you know, this luminous, uh, in a way, modernity. Although inside the, um, the churches, maybe, you know, to use the word luminous is only partly correct. But uh, um, there was drama, but there was also some, some, some optimism. I didn't plan to talk about Marcel Breuer, but uh, maybe it was not a bad idea to to, to do this because uh, you know uh, John Hansen was not uh, uh, some without uh, some predecessors or, or, or one predecessor in this case Breuer, an important one. Uh, here again, uh, you know, uh, there is called brutalist architecture. I don't know, this word sometimes is maybe appropriate, other times maybe less. But brutalism is so-called coming back because I saw an exhibition in Vienna uh, two years ago, uh, a major exhibition called, uh, um, you know, uh, Brutalismus, and uh, they published uh, big books. So there is some, some, some interest in brutalism now because brutalism, is bringing back some vigorous uh, force into architecture and some kind of a reaction to uh, sometimes pale minimalism. So brutalism, you know, maybe the word is not totally, uh, um, you know, justified sometimes, but uh, it, it, it's a valid uh, um, part of, of, of modern architecture. And uh, Johansson also was considered a uh, brutalist, and that's why he lost some buildings. Uh, the Central Library uh, in Atlanta uh, has some similarities with the Whitney Museum in New York. It's not a very big building, but uh, it's a good building. Now this is the library with that interesting structure. So if you do the structure creatively, you know, you, you don't need, uh, you know, other so-called embellishments. It's the, the power of the structure is because it, 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 it reaches a level of, of being sculptural. And if it is also correct, uh, you know, rat uh, rationally speaking or structurally speaking, it's fine. And here you see on the right side uh, the positioning of, of these, uh, um, you know, architectural trees, if I can call them so, which support the, you know, the, the slab at the top level. Now, this is a building in Australia, maybe less uh, significant, although it, it has a certain purity and, well, not so much in this picture. I won't insist on it. Um, uh, then uh, in Rotterdam, a uh, department store, interesting, the, 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 the treatment of the facade. Uh, it's, it's, it's a big building. Oh, 
almost uh, graphic artwork, you would say, this fragment of the facade. Then UNESCO headquarters in Paris, he also worked with a French architect, Zarfus, I think is his name, and, and with uh, uh, Pierre-Luigi Nervi, the great engineer. And this, I'm not sure if this, this was done by uh, the, the, the interest uh, canopy by Nervi or in cooperation with Breuer, but it doesn't really matter. It, it's, a, it's a very good work. And uh, here in the foreground, the sculpture by a mobile by Alexander Calder, the great American sculptor, who was actually an engineer uh, turned sculptor, beautiful. Uh, you know, an interesting service there, you know, but it's, it's sculpturally itself and interesting architecturally. Now, as a furniture designer, Marcel Breuer, he, he was famous for his designs. Again, the Kandinsky chair. Um, I like his uh, boots. <laughs> the Vasily chair is called both the Vasily chair or the Kandinsky. It's about the same thing. Um, he, the great abstract uh, painter. Uh, apparently, he was inspired in this chair by uh, the handles of a bicycle, and apparently was the first uh, chair done, you know, with uh, uh, tubular uh, metallic parts in this way. But he he did uh, various uh, various designs, and and, and there are uh, examples of, 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 of you know very good functional. Well, or less functional, I don't know how comfortable this chair is, but it's interesting uh, visually. Um, okay. Now, uh, John Johansson didn't do design, as far as I know, but um, it's okay. He did other th interesting things. Okay, and here is Mr. Breuer in his office in his later years. Here is the wife of uh, Walter Gropius. Uh, sitting in, a, in the Vasily chair. I, I always wonder who that person was, but I found out uh, kind of late that she, she was uh, Gropius' uh, wife. Okay, so now we go, now we go to John Johansson. Happy birthday, um, John Johansson. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to celebrate you today. Uh, and um, Okay, slideshow from the beginning. Okay, John M. Johansson, uh, he lived a long life, you know, uh, 96 years. Uh, and he was very healthy to the very end. Uh, he was swimming at over 90 and very fit. Incredible. This is the man, a proud, uh, I don't know, probably had Irish uh, ancestry or maybe some Norwegian uh, blood, I don't know. But... Uh, a remarkable man. Here he he was uh, immediately after he finished his studies at Harvard. Uh, young man, uh, optimistic, ready to change the world. Here in an older age, but uh, still you can tell this is an intense man, a serious man, a, a sensitive man. I like him. And, uh, you know, like <laughs> middle life, so to speak, again, young and now, the golden years of high modernity or high modern. Uh, I, I, John Johansson wrote this short text and I will read it to you. I feel confident that most others with me at that time, Pei, I am Pei, Rudolf, Paul Rudolf, Bruno Tsevi, oh. Bram, and those later, uh, Coburn, Frazen, and others would agree with me that Harvard was an invaluable education in discipline and in the instilling of principles of the modern movement. Though we studied under the masters, we were not indoctrinated into a modern style, but given the guidelines to investigate an architecture for our time and circumstance. And we, the second generation of moderns, brought about and witnessed in the 50s and 60s what will well be recorded as the golden years of high modern. So he considered himself as part of the second generation of, uh, of uh, modernity in architecture. Anyway, uh, and then he said uh, he was considered uh, the last, when he died, because he, was, uh, he lived a long life, he, he, he was the last of the uh, Harvard Five who died. After graduation, Johansson began his career with Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill in New York City, 
and was loaned out, so to speak, to work on the United Nations. He then settled into uh, New Canaan in Connecticut, along with Marcel Breuer and Landis Gores, Philip Johnson and Elliot Noyes. Now you see all the Harvard Five. Breaking away from classic designs, the Five gained international acclaim in the 50s as advocates of the modernist tenet form follows function while living and working in avant-garde houses they designed. So they build these houses and sometimes I guess they were allowed to live there for a while by the owners. Interesting. The architecture they created in the early days in New Canaan would later designate them as the Harvard Five. Now, I'll show first, he had the preoccupation and we'll see it at the beginning and we'll see it at the end of the presentation with biomorphic design which was very interesting and is actually today also very relevant and very interesting. This is just a model. Uh, he also built a, you know, like a small house in, of all places in, in Zagreb, but um, uh, we'll arrive there. But keep in mind, please, that he had this preoccupation, although he didn't build uh, you know, generally like this, but he was always interested in the meeting between biology and architecture. Now, a house from 1949, um, you know, you can see the relationship in a way with the modern, modernism uh, promoted by, by Marcel Breuer. Another house, now the, here is an addition, the one on the left uh, by another architect, a later addition. Uh, this was his own house from 1950s. Uh, uh, it's this one, the, the upside down house. He worked in 1951, 1952. Why did he call it upside down? Because he placed uh, unusually the living room at the top level and the bedrooms on the first floor. So uh, Johnson, Johansson's upside down house in New Canaan was featured in one of McCall's magazine. Anyway, we wanted to live with the trees, not under them. That's what he said. It. We wanted the feeling of being suspended in space, so we put the living area upstairs and the bedrooms below. Somewhat uh, from uh, Breuer, the Hungarian farmhouse with the castle, cattle in, in, uh, underneath. It's masonry and the lighter things on top. In the old days in Hungary, they had it open so the heat of the cattle came up, whereas in the, whereas in the cathedrals in the Middle Ages, early mass was pretty cold. It was heated only by body heat. That's how it became the upside down house. The sleep, sleeping quarters were down below, which allowed you psychologically to go back into the earth and come up, come up in the morning and say, good morning world. You see, he, he was a poet uh, at heart. He said this in an interview. So this is his own house. Uh, he built another one, and we'll see it, a very interesting one at the tenth house. The, uh, the upside down, uh, but an interesting conception, and he was also interested in symbolism. Although he built, um, we could say, uh, functional houses in a modernist uh, way, uh, he didn't neglect, uh, you saw the references, you know, to Hungary, to those, uh, uh, you know, farms in Hungary, to, you know, I mean, what architect today would, would, would speak in this, uh, in this way about architecture? Not too many, I think. It shows a certain innocence, I, I would think, and I, I salute this innocence. So, um, okay, so this is the house. Unfortunately, it was purchased by someone and replaced with some kind of a copy of it, this one. Now, this was not done by, this was not, not done by Johansson. This was done by Johansson, and, and for some reason, they, they demolished it, and they built one apparently similar but you can tell this is not uh, this is not really genuine it's mimicking being a johansson building said uh, some pictures i imagine these were taken uh, you know after after his original house was destroyed i have a hard time to imagine that uh, you know he would have easily accepted that kind of fan on the ceiling and anyway um the mcniff house in stockbridge in massachusetts 
Uh, he says again, my own investigation into the box led to Johansson's house number one in the 50s. It was included in the Museum of Modern Art exhibit built in the US as a work typical of a graduate of uh, Harvard Graduate uh, uh, School of Design. In 1955, I built a second glass box, the McNiff House, which will follow. In both these houses, it was the subtleties and the articulation of the box that interested me over its presumed uh, purity. Unfortunately, this picture is not so good, but we have also, you see exactly like in the, in the buildings, especially, the, but not just the domestic architecture of Marcel Breuer, he's not afraid to bring in stone in a primal way. Uh, and uh, I, I think this brings vivacity and even some, some truth in a way of, 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 of the building. You have modernity, you have glass, but you also have, uh, you know, these uh, these stones, which uh, which uh, bring in something else, uh, some, something else, almost archetypal. Destroyed and replaced by this house. So this house was destroyed and and and, and replaced by this house. Can you believe it? And I mean, I could talk for forever about this incredible uh, uh, um, devaluation of something that is important. You know. I mean, this is uh, the sweet, uh, almost sweet gingerbread house, a little bit too sweet, but why would they destroy something that, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know. It, maybe Adolf Loos was, was, was correct when he said people uh, um, love homes and hate art. There was a certain level of so-called art, although it was architecture here, but there was a, a vision, an artistic vision almost, and, and here there isn't. It's just a the sweet, sweet home, too sweet for my taste. Now the Peter and Patricia Dunham house from the 50s, also in New Canaan, the same kind of language that Breuer used and he used too, at least at the beginning. Uh, it, it was a belief, a sincere belief in modernity. And it was that modernity that was brought at Harvard uh, and on the East Coast of the United States by, and not just there, because on the West Coast, also, we had the Neutra and Schindler and other architects. So it was the, 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 not the colonization, but the influence of European modernism in the United States. Uh, with a danger of ne neglecting its own modernity, which was very valuable. That's why all the conferences I attended uh, in New York, uh, nobody mentioned, even mentioned once Frank Lloyd Wright. Can you imagine? They all mentioned Le Corbusier, the European masters, but their own masters, you know, like Sullivan or Richardson even, uh, right, were not even mentioned. Strange. Anyway, um, get back to the houses by Marcel Breuer. Uh, another house he built, uh, I think uh, 15 or, <clears throat> or 20 houses, but 10 of them have been destroyed. This is the real estate man, try to uh, ignore him, the house, but this was destroyed too, uh, also. It's unbelievable. Then uh, another house from 1953, also called the Cave House. I don't know very well why, but uh, it was called the Cave, uh, Cartesian Cave, if I can use uh, an oxymoronic ex expression. Sometimes his houses also have a, a, another name. Besides the name of the owner, they are called the Telephone Pole House, the Labyrinth House, the, in this case, the cave house and so on. Uh, okay, in 1955, the spray houses, he, di he, he designed two. One of them was not built, but very interesting, and you'll see it. Sprayed concrete uh, over a steel frame structure. House number one, which you will see now of the two photos, was never built. But house number two in the following picture uh, was built in Zagreb in Yugoslavia. Um, Yugoslavia uh, in, uh, is not part of Yugoslavia any longer, but at that time it was in 1956 at the trade fair. This is the house that was not built and it shows his interest in biomorphic um, uh, architecture. And this interest uh, will, will haunt him in a way because uh, towards the end of his life, he even published a book uh, that connects with his beginnings in a way. 
it's bad that this house was not built, but uh, you know, he made a project and it's an interesting project. Uh, and um, so architects, even if they sometimes do not build, they can see, express themselves through projects, through, through visionary drawings and uh, you know, there are various ways to, to honor architecture. This is the house that was built in Zagreb and it was built, unfortunately, I only have this picture. Then uh, another house uh, in, from 1955, uh, the same uh, kind of, um, you know, uh, aesthetics. He also played like you see in the plan uh, and you will see also the bridge house. He uses sometimes symmetry, but also it's some kind of a dynamic symmetry. Um, the Goodyear house in uh, in Connecticut, uh, sorry for the picture, uh, I couldn't find a better resolution. And this is the house, uh, a very interesting house built over a, a, a river, a small river, uh, uh, also called, called the Bridge House from 1956. Uh, so Frank Lloyd Wright did falling water above the falling water. <laughs> And here we have a house built about the um, rivulet. Uh, it's not really a, well, it, it is a small river. Um, so Ingels from Big, uh, he didn't do his museum in this way, uh, um, you know, totally out of the blue sky. I'm not saying that Ingels inspired himself from John Johansson, but in a way there is nothing truly new in the world. Uh, this is the house, it's an interesting house, and it actually is uh, very regular in plan and symmetrical, you'll see the plan very soon. Uh, this, this covering, this special uh, roofing is just in, in, the, in the central space. This is the plan. So the living room is also expressed um, uh, archi architecturally in a different way. So it's just above the, you know, the water and it, it's nice. I, I imagine uh, it, it wouldn't be bad to, to live there. And I think it was on sale and it wasn't even expensive. For me, it would have been, but for other people, uh, it was not an expensive house. It was, um, I forgot exactly, but it, it anyway. Uh, and well, some would say he was a formalist. Maybe in this, this case, you could say so, but uh, when you look at the pictures, you don't really have the feeling that it's, uh, I mean, it's a house that doesn't insult nature, it's not foreign to nature, it is made by hu a human being, but it uses geometry and uses the square, but uh, it's, 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 it's fine, I think. Um, yeah. So this was, is the bridge house, it looks nice even in the winter. Um, yeah, I, I probably, you know, living in that living room, <laughs> I mean, not just in the living room, would have been uh, a nice, uh, nice way to live. But in such a context, the forest, uh, you know. Anyway, 1960, another house. Uh, I think this one was destroyed. So again, he lost 10 buildings to the bulldozer. They have been demolished. Uh, it's, it's, it's almost hard to believe. This house, this house, I remember when I studied architecture, was published in L'Architecture d'Aujourd'hui and was, was one of the buildings that I never forgot. And I learned now when I prepared this PowerPoint presentation that it was destroyed, it was demolished, and by whom? By a TV personality in the United States, a man who appeared to be wise and clever and smart. By the way, a smart as, a smartness, um, uh, Bruce, you know, he was maybe smart but not wise. Uh, uh, I'm talking about uh, Phil Donahue. So he destroyed in 1988 a great house. Uh, he owned the house next door and bought the property for more privacy. The house had been emptied for seven in, seven year, several years and was attracting vagrants, Donahue said. So then probably he was defending himself uh, against those who accused him. Why didn't someone take care of this building? Where were 
all those caring people when the building was unoccupied. But why did he demolish it? A very interesting house and uh, built well and, uh, you know, I mean, how many labyrinth houses are in the world? The very name is, is inciting and provoking and it's, it's a great loss. How could they, how could that man who again was supposed to, to know better uh, uh, destroy this house? Uh, sorry, I will come back to it um, uh, later in detail. Now, this is another house that had been destroyed. Uh, the the so-called telephone pole, pole house. Maybe he used telephone poles for its construction. But you see how, how different uh, these houses are. This one from the previous one. You know, he experimented and it's dramatic, it's cultural, it's interesting. Very nice work. Again, I don't understand how they could destroy something like this. And you see the, how ingenious the, 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 the joining uh, of the wooden elements, you know, which are structural. It almost reminds me of uh, temples in Japan. Not bad. Not bad at all. The tube house. <laughs> 1971, um, a little more, uh, you know, uh, it reminds me of a house built by um, Kisho Kurokawa in Japan, since I mentioned Japan already. So there was this optimism in uh, this belief in geometry, in cantilevered cubes, in uh, there was a flying spirit, so to speak. And yes, a belief in, uh, in uh, modernity that you know, is sometimes promoted by the Domus magazine in Italy, uh, belief also in design, per se, a little bit distinct from, from architecture in a way. Now, the John Johansson house number two, also called uh, the tent house, is very interesting and is from 1974 and was built by him for his wife. Um, it was destroyed by fire later that year. We'll come back to this one too uh, and uh, see you know, several pictures with it because it's, it's very interesting. It was his own house, built for him and his wife. Now, uh, the Ellsworth house, called the Greenhouse, designed with an orientation for the sun, with earthen floors, stonework for vines to climb on, and the warm duct system to control temperature and humidity, the greenhouse uh, encapsulates the relate relatedness of man to nature, a symbiotic living together of organisms of low and high order in a union somehow expected of us in this unique and blessed uh, biosphere, said uh, John Johansson. Uh, sometimes we forget that blessed uh, biosphere that he mentions. Uh, there are very interesting details, you know, when you look at this um, uh, stair, it's, 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 it's both, uh, you know, logical but also lyrical in terms of artistic expression or architectural expression. Uh, I like it very much. Unfortunately, I didn't, I didn't discover, I, I didn't uh, find uh, very good resolution pictures, but we can still so see something. Here is the architect himself, uh, but um, the house was, was not his. Uh, this one plays more freely with the um, so-called cubes. They are not quite cubes, but as opposed to the bridge house, which was centralized and perfectly symmetrical, this one is not. So he was not dogmatic at all about his work. And that's very good. Another house um, uh, from 1979, uh, it was almost past 60, 65, 70. Um, Again, uh, uh, just like in the case of Marcel Breuer, we have the presence of natural materials, stone, mosaics, uh, wood, uh, uh, but, uh, the, you know, the so-called imperfections, the warm imperfections of life, of which he, he was not afraid of. Uh, and even, you see, uh, unconventionally uh, bringing together the ducts, the tubes, the metallic tubes, and the, and the stone, uh, and through furniture, wood as well. 
So he was not afraid of, 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 of you know, uh, uniting the opposite in a way. Uh, but this uh, this house was just uh, says here unknown. The floating house and build status unknown. I guess was just a study or a model. Now this is a school he built in 1964 in uh, Columbus, Ohio. And this is a, uh, 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 you'll see that he evol evolves this language, uh, he de develops this language for public buildings of larger scale and uh, you'll see some astonishing uh, um, examples of what he did later. So this is a house in Ohio, but again, you see the, uh, not a house, a school, sorry, uh, uh, is not afraid of using colors, using uh, materials that are, you know, uh, artificial and combine them with, uh, with um, you know, with, uh, with ver verb. I was uh, gladly studying such a school myself. He also built an embassy, so he was, he was a recognized architect. Now, maybe this building is a little bit stiff, but it has qualities. The, the US Embassy in Dublin, I think he had some Irish ancestry, maybe that's the reason why, I don't know. Anyway, the plan seems simplistic. It's a, it's a cylinder in a way, but the central space truly has architectural qualities. Uh, it is a little bit conventional because it is repetitive. It is a public building and a political building in a way, an administrative building. Uh, he was more adventurous in other programs, but he's still interesting and still, uh, you know, he has a unicity. I, I like the central space, you know, this uh, round, uh, you know, circular uh, central space. And you, you say you don't know very well, is it outside? I mean, is it an, uh, an open to the sky or it is an interior space? It's, it's both a courtyard and uh, an enclosed uh, central space. Now, this is a, a, a memorial hall and an opera in, in, in Indianapolis. I, I like it. It's, I mean, almost makes me think almost uh, it has something of uh, early works by Khan a little bit. Uh, and uh, I think it's a good building. Um, you know, uh, it is considered a brutalist architecture, but uh, because of the proportions and the and the play with the volumes, is is I I don't think it has a brutal sensitivity. I, I maybe uh, the materials he uses, but the. the uh, the sensitivity, the sensitivity of, of the design makes it um, more complex. Uh, you will see a, a picture inside, which is, um, you know, the interior is a little bit conventional because it's an opera. And uh, indeed, <laughs> it looks like, a, a, you know, not a very, but no, it's not so small either. It's an opera. Okay. Uh, and, uh, now we go, we arrive and we'll look in more detail at this remarkable house, which I remember so well, uh, uh, looking with a lot of interest when I studied architecture in Architecture de Jordui. Uh, it's so bad that I, I, I don't comprehend how this was destroyed. The, the experience and meaning of the labyrinth house from early times, no, he talks about the labyrinth from early times was present in many cultures that of adventure through a life of fortune and misfortune in pursuit of life's purpose, its source and its uncertain outcome. The curved textured walls of the labyrinth house built of heavy cast concrete and extended to various heights, extending to various heights, occasionally batched into other rooms, expressing the pressure of functions and furnishings in the adjoining room floor to ceiling glass walls joined one concrete wall with another. The walls of the three thousands of big house square foot home were formidably rough on the outside, while the inside surfaces, which are those that the organism marine, the organism uh, mar marine or human lives against, are covered with handmade glass tiles, cushions and hand painted Fortuny, Fortuny, I don't know what this is, silk fabrics. This was his statement uh, from the book, A Life in the Continuum, 
of modern architecture. This is the plan of the house that uh, uh, that uh, uninspired man demolished. Uh, how could he? You know, uh, it's just uh, hard to believe. Maybe the hatred for modernity, hatred for creativity, I, I do not comprehend. Uh, and you see, this was not a house that would easily uh, deteriorate itself because it was built very well. And you know, uh, look at these concrete walls, it was almost like a fortress. So, you know, only the bulldozer uh, could, could tear it down with a... With a the powers that uh, invest in, unfortunately. So this is the labyrinth house that, that doesn't exist any longer. And truly, I think this would have been and is still for imagination and for the culture of architecture, one of the significant houses of the second half of the 20th century, uh, both in, in, inside and outside. But the very idea to build a labyrinthical house is interesting. How many labyrinthical houses were built? You know, but he obviously had affection for the labyrinth because he mentioned the labyrinth as being present in very old cultures. And uh, so this was a, a cultured and sensitive man who uh, reflected on architecture outside of its uh, uh, you know, uh, ready to go uh, dogmas. He was a creator and uh, it shows in his work. Now a library in, from 1966 in Orlando, uh, he built two libraries. Uh, I hear some noises, I don't know, there is a background noise, I, I don't know where it comes from. Anyway, so uh, again, uh, big building by him uh, built in, uh, in, in um, you know, rough or raw concrete in a way, but not just concrete. And you can see there is a musical rhythm in, in the parts where he uses glass. It's not a simplistic building. Um, fortunately, this one escaped the bulldozer, but uh, other, other buildings didn't. Uh, now, this theater in Baltimore does not exist any longer. It was demolished in 2014. Two major buildings by him have been demolished. Uh, I almost said criminally because I, I, I do not comprehend how a so civilized society, okay, you don't agree with necessarily with the aesthet its aesthetics, but it's not a building that leaves you indifferent at all. And uh, it was demolished to make room, I don't know for what. You know, it has vivacity, it is alive, it is uh, sculptural, it is interesting. Uh, look at the plan, uh, uh, plans and, 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 and the section, you'll see another plan uh, now. Uh, it's, it's, it's a building that, that uh, extends itself toward, towards the outside, towards the street, towards the city. It wants to communicate with the city. And the city didn't understand it, so they sent the bulldozers to, to ruin it. Uh, the architects, the community of the architects protested, but they didn't win. Very sad. Very, very sad. Uh, like uh, this one too, uh, this house. Now, uh, I'll, I'll show you the, the house after this picture. This is a small uh, um, uh, intermezzo. It's, on the left is Lebia Suds, and on the right is... Uh, John Johansson. I think they met in New York in uh, uh, the apartment of Lebia Suits, probably. Anyway, uh, I don't know, I expected to see this. Anyway, uh, this is the Godard Library, uh, another library built by him, and this one is, I think, impressive. I mean, uh, yes, you could say that this aesthetics uh, it, it seems to be a little bit too heroic for our time, but uh, uh, I don't think it's anything wrong with uh, with uh, vigor, uh, and I don't think he was an uh, you know uh, I mean his his vigor architectural vigor is is 
genuine and is, uh, it shows, uh, I think, a frank uh, temperament. He was a sincere man and his buildings show it. It has character, the building. Now, there were other architects at, the, at that time who built kind of similarly, you know, Paul Rudolph among them, or the builders, the architects of the uh, City Hall in, in Boston, who, <laughs> uh, I mean, that building had the history of opposition from uh, the city or from mayors. It's an interesting building, this one by, by Johnson. I think it is. And it has, uh, you know, a certain complexity. Uh, it's a crisis you know, as you move around it. Good work. I think it's a good work. And I'm happy we can tell him happy birthday today. You see uh, the plants. Uh, they are alive. The picture is not so good and I apologize, but that's all I found. Um, okay. Now this one is another important building by him that it was demolished. Also in 2014. It seems that that year was fatidic for John Johansson. It's a very interesting building and, and, and I, I I don't know, I don't understand how it came to be demolished. I mean, it's a theater, but look at it. It's, it's an organism. It's, 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 uh, it's uh, in plan, you would say it's, it, it's very functional, but because of these connections between the three parts, uh, it, it becomes interesting, you know? It's, it's, uh, it, it's not a static building, it's a dynamic building. You see the importance of these connections, these bridges. And I think this is true also at the level of human life. If we have bridges between us, you know, yes, we are individuals with our own, with our own uh, histories and curiosities and idiosyncrasies. But if we are able to somehow communicate through, make, build bridges between us, we become kind of like this building. There is a society here here is, is, is almost like a, a microcosm of urban uh, life. You have uh, uh, multiplicity in unity. There is unity, but there, there is also multiplicity. There is variety. It's a very interesting building. And they destroyed it. They demolished it. How come, you know? It, it's incomprehensible to me. All kinds of banal buildings uh, to the left and to the right were not demolished. And this one was demolished. I actually think it was a masterpiece of, uh, of the second half of the 20th century. A very unique building, very convincing, very functioning. Why did they destroy it? It's beyond me. Uh, it's very sad. It only shows we learn nothing. We really learn nothing. Probably the people who sent the bulldozers who studied in good schools, went to museums, traveled all over the world, read books, and they learned nothing, as Rem Kolhas would, uh, would say. He said, we human beings, not that I like necessarily very much to quote uh, uh, Rem Kolhas, but he did say, I've heard him in a conference, he said, uh, we humans don't learn anything. And sometimes I'm afraid uh, it might be true. This was not a building to destroy, really, it was not. Sad. I mean, how many theaters in the world are like this? It was a very original uh, architectural work. And even inside, it's great. You know, it's, it's uh, it probably functioned very well. Still people were not happy. And you see gatherings, gatherings inside, gatherings outside. Sorry for the resolution of the picture. But it seems the building attracted. It was a catalyst for social life. And this, in a way, is the test of any good building. When a public building is a catalyst for social life, it means it has value and it, it functions well as a public space. 
and you can tell it is inviting, it is playful, it is interesting. Anyway, uh, now the university of, uh, he collaborated here, was not the only architect, but even here you see his contribution. You know, the beloved, I love that period, early, late 60s, early 70s. I think there was uh, something romantic, or I like to think so, maybe I, I'm wrong, but uh, those people at the, at the end of the 60s and early 70s had some kind of aspiration to change the world. They, they were idealistic, uh, they, they were dreamers, but uh, I think there was something nice about the way they, uh, their dreams manifested themselves in music and not just in music. Anyway, you see now the relationship with the uh, theatre that was demolished. This was not entirely his work, but you can see his uh, hand, so to speak, his contribution. So you have, you have again, you have unity and you have multiplicity, you have rarity, and that's good. There is togetherness, but it is not a togetherness which erases uh, uh, individual uh, expression and, and contributions. Now, uh, uh, we saw that house actually, and we arrive at the house he built for himself, which uh, burnt, if I uh, understood correctly, one year after it was built. Uh, the, uh, his work was actually very published. About this was uh, an extensive article uh, in the New York Times about it. Uh, so the plastic tent house near Rhinebeck in New York was designed by John Johansson for himself and his wife in 1974. It has said, it has or had at, at the time when this was written, uh, the, the house still existed. It has tra semi, semi transparent corrugated plastic walls to create the feeling of a giant tent. Very interesting because it's, it is a house, it is a home. And a home is, so, so to speak, meant to be stable. But the fact that it is also, uh, uh, in this case, a reference to, to a tent and thus to some kind of a nomadic life, I like this uh, conjun conjunction between stability and instability, because a tent is supposed to be temporary. And uh, 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 there is this fragility in the house. Unfortunately, this fragility succumbed to, to the fire, but uh, I, I like it very much. And it was, you know, it didn't have really, you know, windows because the light was, um, I mean, it had some windows, but it was very luminous. You were living in, in, a, in a light cap, capsule in a way. Uh, and, and, you know, it moves. Here you have the, the domestic, uh, you know, uh, apparatuses, you know, you have the, you know, the, uh, everything that the kitchen has. It has some stone wall too. It has, uh, you know, accents of domesticity, but the house is actually uh, unique and, and uh, interesting. This is the sketch uh, for the house. No, he was very innovative and uh, interested in many things and interested even in ecology, interested in, in communicating with the so-called environment, interested in, 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 the, in the trajectory of the sun on the sky. Uh, so he, he was not really a formalist. I like, I like this house. Too bad it, it, it burnt or it, moved, it was moved or I, I don't know. Would expect inside a tent such a you know uh, cozy uh, <laughs> comforting corner, and he was able to unite the opposites, so to speak. The bedroom, uh, not of large dimensions, but I like it very much. Uh, okay, the bathroom. Interesting house. Very interesting house. And he experimented with materials, with different materials. He was not afraid to unite, as we, we saw before, uh, organic uh, you know, materials with uh, artificial ones. 
the structure is also, uh, you know, uh, uh, in a way explicitly present, but not uh, oppressive. A good architect, in other words. Now, we arrive at the end of the presentation on him. He published a book before he died, a few years before he died, called Nano Architecture. It can be ordered online, uh, it can be found, and, and it is his interest in a, what he calls a new species of architecture. And this is the futurist, John Johansson, a man, uh, maybe around 90, who still dreams. And I like this very much. So here is a man, you know, at 90, dreaming almost like a, almost like a teenager or a very young man. And, and so in a way, uh, he earned his life and, and he earned his uh, being childlike. And I like this very much. This was an early um, um, sketch uh, for a house that we saw at the very beginning, but you see the relationship with his latest interests. Uh, and this reminds me also of uh, Friedrich Kiesler uh, in an, uh, to an extent and the endless house. Uh, so he was able to build also in a Cartesian way, but also assumed, uh, uh, you know, uh, free articulations of, of spaces, uh, the absence of an, uh, you know, uh, rigid geometry. Uh, he was almost searching for the primeval cave, but expressed through a very uh, uh, modern, uh, uh, you know, uh, usage of, of uh, you know, uh, not just forms, but materials as well. This is a page or a, a, an illustration from the, from the book, Nano Architecture, and it was his claim, and you will see a, a small uh, text here. It was a, uh, he was interested in imagining a molecular and engineer house for the year 2200. So 180 years from now, if John Johansson was right, and if the pandemic doesn't uh, ruin our lives, uh, we might one day build molecular engineer houses, uh, which are dreamlike and surreal, and they are alive, not metaphorically, but, uh, but physically. Uh, I, um, I, I'm not very well equipped in this field, but I, I suggest to you, if you are interested, to find the book, you can also find on his website um, references uh, to, to, to this uh, research that he did uh, more detailed. And uh, you'll also read uh, the statements of some um, you know, scientists. And it's very interesting. And I, I think it's very uplifting that to see a man uh, you know, uh, at 90 uh, dreaming courageously, and I, I think that this was this is actually the the last picture of the of the presentation. I call it, you know, the the architect as a visionary. Is clearly uh, he's he was he is still is in for for my imagination for our imagination alive, and is the architect as a visionary. Is the architect who who wants to better life, who wants to contribute to life, who wants to find answers, but also asks questions, just like a child, reinvents himself through asking questions. And uh, I think uh, uh, in, in this sense, his example is positive and worthy of, uh, of being remembered and followed. So I thank you. I ended with a, with a presentation on, uh, on John Johansson. And together with you, I say it again, happy birthday, uh, John Johansson. Are you still here? Because I, 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 I don't see the, maybe I should stop the, the share. Thank you very much, Dan. You're welcome. Struts. Um, and it, it, it's such a fascinating um, project. It sort of starts as a geodesic, it's well-ordered, and then it creates this, could be anything. Um, and, and it, you know, it sort of, he makes these models and, um, then he was, he was asking me about the nodes 
and he shared with me some stuff. There's a note from John. Bruce, this is what I meant to give you yesterday. Enjoyed talking with you, John. So he'd come and meet with me in the office. And I think he was trying to bring this sort of aerospace and science and these actuators into these structures and find ways that it could be stable. It's just, you know, at the time, it was very interesting for us, but it was it was a project without a project, if you know what I mean. Excuse um, me, Bruce, but I, I have the same page that you first um, uh, chose to show. Are you showing something else? Because I only see I'm I only see the same thing. It doesn't move to something else. I don't. Try again. I don't know what the others see, but that's what I saw. Oh, so, I'm sorry. Let me try again. I I was okay. sharing a page, not a screen. Tell me if you can see oh, my. Okay. Yes. Now, now I do. Yes. Thank okay. You. So this, this project that I was talking about, um, you know, it has all these different um, sections: um, heightenance, enlarged, reduced, flattened, amoeboid, amoeboid, and so it's this system that's super dynamic, and here's one of the models that. John had made, and he was looking at um, the joints in the aerospace, aerospace um, linear actuators that are actually used on satellites and how this could be um, put into the architecture. And I, I want I to just to, to share, um, did I stop sharing again? Let me, let yes. me try again here. Screen two. I want to share some of the things that I pulled from the site, from his website. Um, and I think, you know, this was kind of the year that I was involved, that I was, wor that I was working with John, 1992 to 1994. I was, well, I wouldn't say working with John, but we had a dialogue. And I, I really like this quote, Dan, I don't know how... If I could just read this, if everyone will just bear with me, is as we anticipate the future with buildings created from nano architecture, a phenomenal strength, lightness, integral structure, seamless continuity of surface, transparency, and evolving, growing forms, these buildings will reshape the man made environment created from the subatomic level without the use of natural resources, waste producing factories, or laborious physical labor. These masterfully programmed buildings will not outdo the modesty of the natural world. They will exist in symbiotic harmony with the natural environment, adjusting their forms to the needs of people and the seasonal changes of light, temperature, and humidity. Very and nice. Uh, if you allow me to, uh, if you are so kind to go back, yes, to this page. I like this very much where he says, will not un outdo the modesty of the natural world. Mm. Uh, this is beautiful because I think many times the architect uh, is not so modest as, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as Johansson. And, uh, you know, to, to, to do a building that is so innovative, but which does not uh, want to, 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 as he put it very well, to outdo the modesty of the natural world. Meaning, although it is a creation, a human creation, it is still a, uh, it is still modest. It is, it, it is not. Uh, uh, it doesn't try to to overcome nature. Uh, it's very inspiring. I think. Thank you. Yeah, and I, and I think, probably. The thing that's having the biggest impression on me today when I look back at uh, my interactions with John and I look at John's career and his work, especially his later career, is that there's this, and I, I, I pulled this quote from Louis Kwan, Louis Kahn, because I was reading about this yesterday on a separate track. But, you know, wonder is the forerunner of all knowing. Wonder is the primer, primes knowing. And I think John was such a, creative spirit especially with this his nano architecture and his his in the studio we were exploring ideas of electromagnetism um evolving structure 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 that was more about the, the architecture that was more about experience and 
and and akin to life and the dynamic way we live our lives. And there was what I'm trying to get to here is there was there was a comfort in not knowing whether or not it worked and not knowing exactly what it was, but exploring. Um, and I, I, I find that really comes alive in, in some of these sketches and ideas. And I, I think here's John holding some of his beautiful sketches and this, this sort of pedal architecture. And I think, I think the studio was, was at Pratt was centered around a, um, performing arts center and you could use any sort of elect any sort of magnetism like uh, maglev kinetic architecture but something it had to evolve and change according to the performance and the user's experience and it was just it, it's it's so it's so forward-looking that even now I look at it more than 25 years later and it just it just really surprises me and how we could pick this up and take inspiration from John now and try to explore some of these ideas that he was so generous um, and curious. And I mean, I mean, it was it was it was it was so odd for me that that like here here I am. I was like, I was what well, less than I was. In my, um, I wasn't even 30 years old, and he was 76, and he was, his design spirit was younger than mine at that time. He was, you know, like he he had that ability to play with these ideas, and that it was a safe space. Um, Mahat, if maybe you can help me a bit, um, and 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 add to to what I'm it's it's yeah. turning out to be very hard for me to articulate um uh, but just such a wonderful um spirit to celebrate yeah there was there was no such thing as a boring conversation with john and uh, he always riffed off any idea that you had and took it to another level I don't know if you had that experience, uh, Bruce, and having conversations with him. But I, I was just, I was just, I'm trying to, to remember, like, I'm just trying to recollect, like, like, I think I felt a lot of times in awe and I was like, it was just, it was challenging me a little too much structurally mm -hmm. at the time because, you know, there weren't real projects and they would require a certain level of immersion to figure them out and right. take them more. And I just, I wasn't willing to do it. Maybe I wasn't able to do it at the time. I didn't have the time and the space to do it. Um, Mahat, if maybe, maybe. Also, uh, we, are, we, I, we are kind of trained as engineers to always uh, think of the, the practical implementation and the immediate uh, workability of things which I think sometimes gets in the way of a free exploration of some of these ideas. Yeah, and, and Mahat, if maybe, um, I, I don't want to call you out too much, but maybe you can expand a little bit more on, on, on your background with John and our background with John and just what it means to, what it meant to us then and what it might mean to us now, because Dan is so kind to offer this offer this opportunity to reflect on John's work. And I think we, we interacted with John at a very different level, at a very different time than most people did, that, mm. that is work. I mean, uh, the history of that is uh, Arup uh, opened an office in New York back in uh, 1988 or thereabouts. And uh, it was a structural engineering only office and in 1992, uh, I transferred from London to come to New York to set up the uh, mechanical and electrical side so that it would become a fully integrated office uh, providing integrated design. Somehow John got to know that we were just starting this up. And he suddenly appeared in the office one day, uh, introduced himself, and we sat down, had a conversation. And he said, I'm teaching this studio at Pratt, and it would be really good if... Uh, you could uh, 
come as an integrated team with structural and uh, and the environmental side to to help participate in that studio and that's how that happened and it must have been uh, in 93 maybe maybe 92 uh, that that happened that's my memory of it does that fit in with your memory as well bruce absolutely and it it was a the studio was a theater and i'm just looking at this text here because it's kind of what this project's about and it's really interesting here he's saying the multi-purpose theater in common use yeah. today attempts this flexibility but does it poorly hmm. i'm just thinking had we had our acoustics capability at that time that would have taken that studio to a whole other level wouldn't it yeah but it, it, it i think it would have been a tangent Mahadev. yeah maybe maybe hmm. Because, because um, the the real challenge was was I think he found he found a program that was so appropriate to the challenge, but the real real challenge was this um, should I call it biomorphic architecture. Mm -hmm. Which I think you ended up exploring with him to a greater depth than uh, any of the rest of us. Yeah, I, I, you know, just reflecting on it now, I, I'm, I'm going to say missed opportunity. Hmm. Uh, we're just, I think. We couldn't yeah. give it enough time, could we? No, and I think, I think you put it really well, like, um, I'm, and I don't want to paraphrase you, so let me, let me just riff on it a little bit, is we're constrained not just as engineers, like, you know, trying to fix things and make them work all the time, but we're constrained by practicalities as well of our business. Mm. I mean, this, 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 this stuff, this, these, the work that was, we were doing with John uh, rests so firmly in academia, right? Mm. And yet there's no way we could have just dropped everything for two days to go and uh, explore things with John. It had to be in little bites of an hour here and uh, uh, two hours there. Yeah, and we can't, there's, I guess there's a certain threshold for a practitioner um, that when you get involved as an adjunct faculty or you're, you're in a university setting that, that you you know, at some point you can cross this threshold of just bringing um, the, the, the world of the practitioner to the ac academy, but bringing the world of the academy to practitioner. Yeah, that's more difficult. Mm. Bruce, if you are so kind, could you uh, uh, display again that page with a quotation from uh, Louis Kahn? If it's not difficult. Yeah, this one, because I, I think you chose uh, uh, in a very inspired and inspiring way this, this quotation, you know, and, and what, what Khan says is, is almost identical, although the, 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 the words are different with what uh, Einstein said, you know, that truly wonder is, is, uh, come, is, 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 uh, is is the engine and and without it without curiosity uh, there won't be really you know knowledge either so what do you do i am asking you because you taught and uh, you are teaching now again what can you do so students enhance their curiosity instead of having it uh, you know arrested because we struggle here with this problem the the, the students uh, somehow, uh, instead of being uh, uh, open and, uh, and uh, very, very curious, they seem to be, uh, you know, dwarfed by uh, the requirements of, of, of the school and, uh, and uh, which, which actually arrests curiosity. So how could the school uh, function in such a way that curiosity is encouraged and enhanced instead of being, um, you know, uh, restricted and, and in the end, uh, uh, 
killed, ruined. Yeah, uh, let me start, and, and Mahadev, maybe you can add to this as well. I'm, I'm just going to start teaching again um, in August. I have had almost a 10-year break, and that's the big question, Dan. Um, that's, that's certainly the big question, and, and I find in practice, because I'm, I've been away from the academy, but more in, in work, that uh, my generation is tending to blame the younger generation for a lot of these shortcomings, this lack of curiosity. And I would, I would say it's more about a lack of hard work that and there's this expression that um, success be comes before work only in the dictionary. Um, but I, I think most of the blame, or maybe even entire the blame, is, is more on my generation than, than the younger generation. And that when I look to people like John and how much John challenged me, for example, and challenged everybody that, you know, was going to have a design conversation with John, do I challenge the next generation as much as they challenged me? Do I set as much of an example of a, an exploratory, um, all, lifelong learner that John did? So I didn't answer your question, Dan. And, no, and you Mahadev, did. You did. Mahadev, maybe maybe you can add a little bit to that. No, I think I think you are absolutely on the right lines there, there Bruce. And I see this. Uh, uh, I'm technical faculty in a, in a graduate program, and uh, the students often come and consult me on their studio projects, uh, often without the knowledge of their studio professor. And that gives me the opportunity to see how different studio, architectural professors are setting their, their studio uh, 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 problems, if you like, for, for the students. And it's remarkable that some of them are much more challenging than others. And it's those challenging ones, they're the ones that come and they want to have conversations with other people to just kind of round out their own thinking on uh, whatever it is that they're doing. And those are the most interesting and productive studios, I think, where uh, the outcome is not in any way determined, but there is an issue that is being explored. And the students, almost by taking away the structure of, okay, we want you to do step one through 10 and then you're done and leaving it much more open, they, f they find that almost uh, terrifying, but it yields the best work at the end of the day. I don't know if that was at all helpful. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it, it's amazing. It's the, um, I think it's the, the question of our time, Dan, Mahadev. I really do. I think it's the question of our time. And uh, our Mahadev, uh, Dan, Mahadev worked with uh, Peter Rice and Tom Barker for many years as well. Um, and it's just such a pleasure to have this dialogue with you, Mahadev. Um, mm. But I, I remember I was in Peter's office one day and he looked at me and uh, he was of course, very enthusiastic, intensely curious, like John. And he said to me, he said, how do you make someone more enthusiastic if they don't already have it? He said, that's, to me, the, the essential problem is how do, you, how, do you, how do you grow enthusiasm in someone that doesn't already have it? Hmm. And so if they're not getting it in their education, they're not getting this sort of boundless curiosity, the sense of wonder that that's why I put the quote there from Khan. And I actually picked, I was reading this paper yesterday because I was looking at Le Ricolet's work. Um, and there's this paper by Marco Frascari that I want to share. It's called Light Six-Sided Paradoxical F um, Fight. Um, and it's about Italo Calvino's um, forecast for lightness in the millennium and Le Ricolet's work with hexagons and hexagonal structures. It's, it's really fascinating article. 
um, and it talks about wonder as well. Um, and I wanted to, let me see if it's in here. Uh, I, anyways, that's where I, I picked that up from. And so, Dan, you started with, when you, when you were talking about um, Brewer and um, I don't even know if I say his name correctly, and Johansson, you started with this light heaviness or heavy lightness. Can, yes. you, can you expand on that a bit more? Because that's really fascinating to me. Well, Bruce, I don't know if, if, if I can improvise now a correct uh, answer. I, you know, and I, 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 I can I can um, express some thoughts mostly uh, of a speculative nature that I think the challenge in in almost any creative work uh, resembles somehow uh, the the preoccupations and the interests and the aim of the alchemist. I know Leonardo da Vinci didn't value alchemists too much, but when I read a book by Carl Jung called Psychology and Alchemy, I understood that maybe what Carl Jung said was, was true. He said that a true alchemist is not the one who wants to produce, you know, so-called um, real gold. Uh, they, they were searching for the inner gold, for the psychological uh, gold. And there mm. was even this, I don't know Latin, but I, I, um, I, I remember this uh, phrase in Latin, aurum nostrum non est aurum vulgi. In other words, our gold is not the vulgar one, it's not money, it's not material, it's, it's spiritual. And, 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 and the, the goal of the alchemist was to unite the opposites, to unite fire with water, to unite the masculine principle with the feminine principle, to unite cold with a worm and, and so on. With a, they work with pairs of opposites. And so the heavy lightness or the light heaviness, I see it as some kind of a, uh, uh, an attempt to unite the opposites. And, and when, you, when you succeed in doing that, something miraculous happens. I think you arrive at that, uh, I forgot how you know they, they used to call it, but it's not so important in, in, in alchemy, lapidus or lapis, you know, like the, it, it, it was the, the aim of, 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 of the best alchemist to arrive at that almost impossible conjunction of the opposites. So if a, if a structural engineer is able to create a structure that is both heavy and light, I think uh, in that sense that that engineer becomes uh, uh, an alchemist in, 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 the, in the good and sensitive uh, sense of the word. Mm. I don't know if I expressed myself uh, correctly, but I think this, this, uh, this attempt to unite the opposites um, uh, can be found uh, in, in all arts and in all, in all uh, human activities, you know, uh, that, that have a creative, uh, creative value. But I think what Marcel Breuer did was, was very valid. And uh, I think the engineer and the architect can cooperate to, um, to create buildings that, are, uh, that, that do not arrest that sense of wonder. Because finally, it comes down to this. How can we create buildings that encourage people to, to be even more enthusiastic? Although I understand uh, the question that uh, Peter Rice had, you know, how could you, how could you bring enthusiasm to someone who never had it or who, who didn't have it before? But maybe that's the, that the inner fire could be provoked or encouraged. I don't know, maybe it's wishful thinking. No, I'm struggling with this question because I am, I am uh, saddened by the fact because I addressed the invitation to 2,000 students and 300 faculty members to attend these meetings from which they can learn something and, and they do not attend. And right now we are almost all of us kind of, uh, you know, because of the social distancing, we are, uh, you know, indoors a lot of times. So they could do it. And I think it's missing that curiosity. And without that curiosity that John had, uh, 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 I, I don't think you can actually do a, a creative work. And Bruce, I'm very moved 
by the fact you are an engineer, but you're actually a humanist. You know, I mean, your references, your choice of the of the uh, thought of, uh, of Louis Kahn and uh, uh, your interests. I, I mean, this is beautiful. That it, it shows that actually, uh, you know, you you can very well be an engineer and at the same time uh, be a, a sensitive uh, uh, humanist. And unfortunately, the architects to me seem to be less sensitive than than you are. Sorry to say it, but uh, I would have liked some engineers to choose because I see idealism in you and I saw it before when you presented your own work. And this idealism, I don't know what's going on now in the United States. I know that Stephen Hall said when he was asked, uh, what do you recommend uh, young architects and students? He said, remain idealistic. The soul needs the, the ideal more than the real. And I keep repeating it to many people, but they don't hear it. It's because, mm. it's because somehow, I don't know, something was lost. And I hope it's just here now. I mean, you know, in my uh, close proximity that it is like this and not in, in you know, in your proximity. So I, I don't know how are the schools in the United States, but I remember when I used to go to Columbia University, there was an immense curiosity in 1992, 93, 91, when Bernard Chumi became dean there, when there mm. was a lecture, the, the Avery Hall was full. In fact, there was not that, that it was full, but there were many people who couldn't get in. So Bernard Chumi had to install uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the space outside of the amphitheater uh, monitors. So, because so many people, and there were people coming from work, you know, taking the subway sometimes for a long time. I love that. You know, I, I, it was that that great intensity of, of quest and, and that curiosity. And it was beautiful. And, and I, I, I don't see it here where I am now. And uh, I, I hope, I hope it's just uh, this place that is, is like this. But you, you, from what you told me, I understood that, um, you know, somehow times are changing everywhere and that uh, even in the States, maybe that curiosity is not so present. I like to think that it's not like this. You, you can tell me, um, you know, I, I, please tell me that I am wrong. It is not like this. It is, it is different. Um, I, I don't know how to, to comment to that. Dan, mm -hmm. I, I would just say that, you know, from my perspective, the, the thing, the, the, the kind of extraordinary thing that I see about myself is my curiosity. And I think that's great for an engineer. It's to, great for anyone, Bruce. <laughs> uh, and so how do, how, do, how do we teach people to be more curious? I don't know. Well, to be more curious is to be in a way more childlike. Because the yeah. child is curious, the, the child steps into the world <clears throat> and asks questions because everything is new for the child. And, and that, you know, that curiosity should be present at all levels of our lives because the world is indeed very complex and actually very beautiful. I mean, yes, there is pain, there is suffering, but there is also beauty. The sun rises every morning. And so... There are many things to make us joyous and make us curious. And when you don't have that curiosity, it's very, very sad. I, I'm very happy that you have it. And uh, I know other people have it, but I wish more people would have it. You know, the more, the better. So given that it is something natural in children, I think maybe the challenge is not how do you inculcate it in people but how do you stop people from losing it as they grow up? Yes. Yes. And do you have any suggestions? That's something that John Johansson never lost. He had that childlike curiosity all the way till he passed. How do you think, how do you think it's, it's possible not to stop people uh, losing it? You know, how, how can we, uh, how can we, in, because maybe initially, you know, all children are curious. How come some keep that curiosity and others, maybe many, lose it? Why is it so? 
Yeah. You know, I, I want to take a little tangent. Just, I read this again yesterday. I, um, this is coming from Le Ricole, an engineer. It says, I no longer believe as I once did in beauty and the harmony of nature. Those are ready-made formulas impregnated with that pious naturalism of the 18th century. I believe much more in the bizarre, in the sign, in curses. I just, I find that so intriguing to come from an engineer, just kind of letting his guard down a little bit, mm. showing some vulnerability, some passion, some personality. And I really, I really love that. I wanted to share that. Um, Maybe we'll dedicate. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I, I I don't know enough about Kepler and about Le Ricolet. I know the names, and but God, we can explore so much, you know. And I see on this page of yours, uh, uh, Bruce. I see the Chinese proverb, and this, uh, you know, the, the, the I don't know. <laughs> You know, I just look at random at certain words and, and I'm intrigued and provoked and I become curious. I don't understand those numbers or those formulas, but I see myth. I mean, when, I, when an engineer is telling me about myths, I become very exciting. In a Celtic goddesses, my God, please, uh, Bruce, please stop because, you know, I get carried away. <laughs> no, it's very beautiful. I mean, God, we, we could explore uh, great things and, and, and maybe the, the humanist can learn from the, the engineer. Sometimes the engineer is more uh, of a humanist than the so-called professional humanist. We are all human beings at the, at the base. So I think these labels of engineer and architect and so on are, are somewhat superficial. Yes, yes, they are. Let me make another connection for you. Uh, Gropius in, uh, in the 40s, 1940s, maybe early or mid 40s, wrote a book on uh, total architecture. I don't know if you're aware of this book. Uh, yes, and I think I know what you're going to say. It's the expression about the engineers. Please continue, please. And uh, he actually had a relationship with Ovarup, and Ovarup was quite influenced by Gropius in their conversations. And Ovarup absorbed this term of total architecture and actually built it into the uh, the ethos of our company. Not many people realize that it started off in a conversation with Gropius. By the way, uh, uh, over, I, I still hesitate. I, I'm afraid I do not pronounce well uh, this short name actually, but his birth, birthday will, will happen uh, Kind of soon, I, I know it is on the list of the celebrations I intend to initiate. And may I, I want to invite both of you and maybe other people. It will be the birthday of, of Arup. And uh, I, I think it would be great if we dedicate, uh, you know, a, a meeting uh, on Zoom uh, talking about him. If, if you would that, like that would, to participate. That would be great. Yeah, that would be great. Um, can I can I share another story just back on the childhood, how we lose our curiosity? Yes, sure. And this is from the same paper. So um, during our childhood, we were told the story of the three little piglets that built three small houses. Two of them were extremely lighthearted and merrily happy, but squandered fruitful time by playing their musical instruments. The outcome was that they hastily built their houses using light materials and structures, which did not oppose any challenge to the fury of the bad wolf. The third, a wise and cheerless old piglet, the sad Greya of the children's story, built a heavy brick house, which saved him as well as the other two from the hungry wolf. Thereafter, they lived sadly within a weighty house. <laughs> Where are these pages from, <laughs> Bruce? Because they are very interesting. Oh, this is a, this is a paper by Marco Frescari, Light Six-Sided Paradoxical Fight. I think it's maybe 20 years old. Uh, I, 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 uh, Marco Frascari was not a designer and, and an architect? 
I, I don't know him. I just know this paper. No, because I, I, I think I, I have Ricola. a PowerPoint presentation on him. Uh, I'm a little bit confused because I have many, but I think, yeah, he was a famous uh, Italian designer. But, but um, Mahadev, um, maybe this is how we lose our curiosity. Is It's pounded into us, good yeah. and bad. So, so hard work and you know hunker down hmm. stay in a you know dark building with that doesn't let a lot of light in and you'll well, be safe but you you have to sacrifice something for that safety yes and uh, i had that conversation with uh, norman kurtz who is the the founder of flack and kurtz who is uh, one of our competitors in the whole environmental design and uh, this was at a time when uh, they had become very kind of standard in the way in which they did engineering and Arab had come with a more kind of innovative approach. And his argument was that the innovation opens you up to risk. And so you have to re be ready for uh, things going wrong and lawsuits and so on. And uh, they didn't want to be ready for that within, uh, within their practice. So words to that effect. Uh, and it was just an informal conversation. So I'm not saying that was his philosophy of life or anything like that. But I think that when you get uh, shackled to the need to run an enterprise and make money and uh, be safe and all of that, you do, you do try and de-risk the enterprise by taking away some of the, the creativity that happens in, uh, in large organizations. And I think that, uh, it's something that we have to beware of. It's, it's, it's very much the, the story of the three pigs, though, isn't it? Yeah, it is the story of the three pigs, completely. Uh, you know, um, Dan, I, I love what you said about the lightness and the heaviness and the, what was it, the vulgar gold? Yeah. yeah, in Aurum uh, Vulgi, yes, the vulgar gold as opposed to, you know, uh, the real one, the, the, the psychic one. Hmm. I, I, I truly recommend that that book is, is a very good book by Carl Jung. It's called Psychology and Alchemy. Uh, huh. Yeah. I know, I, I was almost obsessed with that book for a few years. I did even some projects where I was trying myself to unite the opposites in a way. It was an inspired book by, by Jung. It's, you know, it's very interesting back to our discussion the other day on Van Dosberg, how he was seeking as a colorist to contradict the architecture. Yes. It, it kind of, it, you know, it's sort of this lightness, heaviness, right? This sort of, this contrast um, creating harmony, right? Harmony, con harmony through contrast. Yes. Yeah, any, any other thoughts from anybody on how to inspire curiosity and enthusiasm? There are some students here, so I would like to, to hear uh, from them. Well, um, I was thinking about what you're saying about uh, regarding the fact that um, um, we lose our interests or maybe uh, lose our passion for, uh, for certain things. I think, by be as you said, by being comfortable in a position or uh, by having uh, too much fun, uh, as the two pig the two piglets said, they just wanted to have fun and enjoy their life without uh, having any um, any meaningful um, result after their uh, experience. So maybe. That's why we sometimes lose the passion and the curiosity as well. I don't I because we uh, 
get too comfortable and forget to search or research? What do you think? <clears throat> Guys? You know, if you want, I, I could uh, quickly search, although I'm not, uh, I'm not organized, but if I can find the thoughts on education of Albert Einstein, um, I, I, I have great sympathy for what he said, and he says it in many ways, uh, that uh, true education is not about accumulating facts. It, it is actually about desire, and yesterday when we talked about um, um, about um, Gaston Bachelard, when he, when he said man is a creation of desire, not a creation of need. A very interesting distinction, and this distinction also was made by Louis Kahn. He also talks about need and desire. And I think curiosity leaves us when, you are, when we are concerned only with need and we forget the desire because it is the desire that makes us uh, open and, uh, and, uh, and in, in investigative, uh, curious. Uh, and, and, and without that desire, what do you do? You know, you live in the predictable, you live in the measurable. Yes, you live safely, but sadly. And mm. uh, that's the problem. You know, if we are only concerned with needs, uh, yeah, we are safe, but uh, the result can be uh, uh, devastating for curiosity and for the joy of living, actually. So maybe Nietzsche was right uh, when he said, live dangerously. A certain level of danger is perhaps necessary in life, meaning of instability. That's what danger means, instability. But yes, it's easy to say it and it's difficult to do it because fear does exist. Mm. But uh, it's like in love, you know, safe life, love is not really love. There is uncertainty in love, you know. It's, uh, uh, there is instability and that instability makes it exciting and uh, interesting. Sometimes, yes, there is pain, but... Uh, but it's better to, to be alive and, and, and loving than uh, safe and inert. <laughs> yes, true. So for, <laughs> uh, I imagine, you know, in architecture, for uh, if we talk about structure, how do you make a structure which is stable and at the same time somehow uh, unstable, you know? Yeah, and I think that's really good. Back to Johansson and some of the the images I was showing of um, of the stuff he was sharing with me. Uh, let me let me share a couple of thoughts. Um, let's see which one is a good one to put it on. I think it's probably. I just want to ask all these uh, uh, drawings uh, are uh, John Johansson's. Yes, um, let, me, let me let me share share a thought um, an experience when I was in. school, college I took some architectural design courses with my engineering courses and I was chasing down one of my professors and badgering him during his office hours or or even maybe it wasn't even his office hours and I forget what I was looking for an answer to and he looked at me and he was a little frustrated with me and he said to me he goes look 95 percent of your education is in the library five percent of your education is in your courses from your teachers and that was the end of that conversation with him. <laughs> and I was shocked by that because, you know, you, you spend so much resource to be in university and it's so important and it really had a profound effect on me. And then early on in my career, I think I'd just come back from four, four years with, with working with Mahadev and Peter Rice. And I was presenting at the university and the former dean, the guy who founded the university, who was a great mentor to me, um, grabbed me by the shoulders, looked me square in the eyes, and he said to me, he says, you've chosen the difficult path. You need to find a wife who's rich that can support you so that you can do your work. And that had a really profound effect on me as well. And I think, you know, what, you know, the first one was, 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 was telling me that, 
that I need to be intensely curious because that's 19 out of 20 um, of, of what I'm going to, what my career is going to be is based on my curiosity. And the second was that it made this point that this kind of stuff isn't for everybody. And it's not the easy path. It's a difficult path. And you're either going to suffer or you have some sort of independent form or resources that can support you to do this. Because like what I'm showing on the screen is just such a good example. It's like there's, there's amazing innovation in this, but who has the time and the energy? Yeah, who will pay for that exploration? <laughs> Do you think uh, John Johansson's wife did so? <laughs> oh, I don't, I don't know. I don't really want to speculate. I was just that wasn't coming from John. That was coming from George Haslin, which was he was an amazing man, amazing, amazing man. Hmm. He, he founded the uh, College of Architectural and Environmental Design at uh, California Polytechnic in San Luis Obispo. But Bruce, would you uh, would you uh, uh, trade uh, your curiosity and your sense of wonder for a more, uh, let's say, a stable and safe uh, way of living? No, I mean for me that that would be vulgar. But I I feel extremely fortunate and lucky that I've been able to be inspired by mentors like Johansson. Peter Rice and Mahadev, who's on the phone right now, who's on the call, is is one of my mentors as well. Um, you can't put able... in category as those people, Bruce. Come on. Oh, please, Mahadev, you're just being modest. But this, I, if you allow me, Bruce, I admire in you and uh, now in. in uh, our other guest uh, is, uh, it seems to me the, the engineers are usually, they seem to be more modest than, than architects. And uh, they have great merit in their works, but, but they are more modest, I think, uh, generally than, than the architects. And uh, <laughs> I hope I, I'm wrong. I, I have a, a slightly different uh, view on that, if I may share it. Um, Please. I think that uh, an architect requires a, an extensive amount of self-confidence if they want to do something innovative and different. Because the thing about engineering is, uh, and let, I'll dumb this down, so uh, I don't mean, mean to trivialize it, but basically you can tell whether a structure is working or not, because if it's working, it's not falling down. And uh, with a, an environmental system, if you're comfortable, it's working. If you're not comfortable, it's not working. So there's a very objective uh, uh, and basic way in which you can determine whether something is successful or not. Yes, you can argue about how elegant, uh, elegantly or efficiently it has been achieved, etc. But at a functional level, it's very clear that uh, the thing works or it doesn't work. With an architect, I mean, when you do something innovative with your design and you uh, drive it through all sorts of uh, opposition and naysayers and you finally get it built and then you subject yourself to the, the criticism of all the architectural critics out there who uh, uh, think they know better, that's a very scary place to be. And I think it is only by a sort of super abundance of self-belief and self-confidence that you can actually have the uh, uh, the fortitude to withstand that kind of uh, situation. That that's what I feel about that. Thank you, and you are right. But what do you do? Because there are, for example, Frank Lloyd Wright said, uh, you know, early in life I had to choose between being honestly arrogant and uh, falsely modest, and I chose to be uh, honestly arrogant, and I have no reason. <laughs> To change to something else now, but the, mm. but, but he had the talent, uh, not to say the genius, to sustain uh, his arrogance with uh, with his creation. But what do you do with uh, with people who are less uh, gifted, who are still arrogant? And uh, you know, I understand what you say for an architect to 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 sustain his work, to promote it, to to have it built. 
yes, you do need uh, some confidence, but what do you do with people who actually have almost nothing to offer and uh, they are still arrogant? Because yes, it is true, the architect has kind of like a godlike uh, uh, positioning in the world, you know, uh, but uh, is it always uh, justified this godlike position? I don't think so. There were great builders. I'm referring to the, um, let's say, to the anonymous uh, builders of the Gothic cathedrals. They mm. never signed their works, and they, no. they erected some of the most incredible buildings, uh, at least in Europe, that were built. And, and, and uh, th this happened also in Asia. I know there are beautiful uh, Hindu temples where, yes. where it is known that the, the most... Uh, um, uh, perfected uh, parts of the building are not even made for the human eye. They are made for the divine eye. They are hidden for the, from the human eye. So mm. I guess you, you could be a great creator and also be modest. Um, you can. Um, mm. the, 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 there, is, there was this um, important modern uh, Romanian sculptor, Brancusi or Brancus, who said, work like a slave, command like a king, create like a god. So you are both the slave who works very, very hard. You are yeah. also the one who makes decisions, uh, sometimes difficult to make. You are king-like, so to speak. But in order to create, you have to find inspiration in, uh, in, the, in the work of nature, let's say, or the divine work to unite all three planes of, of, of uh, you know, being, so to speak, in the world is not easy. Mm. I, I actually think, you know, I, I refer again to this uh, favorite uh, philosopher for me, Friedrich Nietzsche, who said, kind of, I mean, I, I don't use exactly his words, but the idea was to be um, uh, audacious like the eagle, so to fly high and to have independence and to be uh, unreachable in a way, but at the same time to be to have discernment, as he put it, and so to be both the eagle and the snake, and uh, it's not easy at all to combine the two because one is flying very proudly, and the other one is uh, is never leaving the earth, and I don't know if I explained well, but. It's again no. uniting the opposites. The, the other way I've heard that expressed is that uh, it's important to have your head in the clouds, but to make sure your feet remain on the ground. Yes, yes, beautiful. Yes, it's true. <laughs> it's, it's not easy. <laughs> I mean, I not know from my own life. <laughs> uh, I really enjoy but, our talk. I regret I need to leave the conversation now, but uh, that was very interesting. Thank you for uh, organizing this event. Well, we thank you for your participation. Thank you. Something, um, just bring it back to John uh, uh, Johansson on that uh, discussion about uh, arrogance. Is I felt John was very, very nice and humble man. And very, very easy to have a conversation with. That was my impression. Bruce, again, uh, we don't hear you very well. I just wanted to bring it back to the discussion about arrogance and John, and I just want to emphasize that from my experience, John was a very, very nice gentleman, um, very humble, very, very open to ideas, and very, very good with the students. That was m my impression. No, and it is shown in, in the complexity of his works. I'm, a, I'm, go I'm going to sign off as well. Thank you, everybody. Well, thank you, Bruce, very much for, for your participation. And uh, we, we hope to, maybe we'll, uh, we'll organize an interesting event, maybe to talk about some of the issues that we address today. Thank you very much for being present. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, Bruce. Bye. Have a nice Bye -bye. day. Okay, so now... Uh, what do we do? What time is it? Well, we almost spent two hours together, maybe a little more than two hours.
but I think it was a nice uh, an, a nice afternoon uh, or early evening, and we did uh, celebrate um, uh, an important architect. And tomorrow, if you are not bored of me and my my celebrations, because I'm beginning to receive uh, alarming uh, messages from some people to uh, to remove their names from my list of contacts. So I'm embarrassed and I even get de depressed. But tomorrow I will talk about Harry Wills, an architect at this point I don't know much of. I saw two of his buildings, but I will study during the night and I will prepare a PowerPoint presentation. He was a very interesting man and I will just tell you this about him. He was asked, I guess, uh, about his religion or what he believes in. And he said something like this. He said, my father was an episcop, Epis I don't know, some uh, denomination from episcopalism, something like this. So my father was an uh, episcop. Uh, anyway, my mother was a um, Presbyterianism and I'm an architect. So <laughs> he said it in an amusing way that, that his religion was actually architecture. So uh, I look forward myself to learn about Harry Wills uh, this very evening and tomorrow. If you allow me again, I will send messages out. I invited a lot of people. I invited all the faculty at Harvard because they, you know, John Johansson studied there, uh, but they don't respond. They are arrogant, but it's to their loss because I think we had a nice talk and, and thanks to these two engineers, brilliant engineers, I want you to remember and to know, we are talking here, I don't know who the other gentleman was, but if he was the mentor of Bruce, I imagine he is a very accomplished uh, engineer, but Bruce himself is very accomplished. I mean, they work for the, the most important uh, engineering firm in the world, OVR, and uh, they both work with Peter Rice, who was considered a, a genius in engineering. Uh, he did engineering for the opera in Sydney, for the Louvre um, uh, glass pyramid, for uh, La Grande Arche, also in Paris, uh, for Lloyd's in, in London. So you can imagine this. We had two guests of the of a very high caliber in in, in engineering, and you see how, you saw how modest they are and how accommodating and how human. I, much more than uh, lesser people that I know many lesser people that I know. Anyway, so Anna, I expect you to say something. You always are inspired to say something, so please. <laughs> well, I was, um, I was thinking about what you said that uh, engineers are more, um, are more humane than, uh, or more in touch with their human side than uh, other people that study human, uh, human studies or something like that. And uh, I actually remembered when I um, uh, took the exams after I finished high school that, um, that uh, the teachers that were um, um, actually grading our oral exams for Romanian uh, told us that um, the ones that uh, studied um, um, mathematics, physics, and other uh, sciences like this uh, were more prepared uh, in the language department than the ones that studied the, uh, the um, human studies. And maybe it is because we want to search for more, or I don't know. Maybe that's why Bruce and Mohammed were so much, are in touch with their human side as well, so more than others? Well, um, I also think it's because of the nature of their own profession, you know, because as an engineer, you, you, need, you need to build what, what, uh, what the architect dreams. And, and, and uh, so it's not a joke. The engineer has to make it work. So you are humbled in a way uh, by, 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 by reality that you have to consider seriously many things that uh, sometimes the architect uh, you know ignores so i guess uh, you know he, he almost by necessity being an engineer forces you to be let's say you know a little modest 
you, you, because if you are not, you risk of having the building uh, collapse. Uh, so I don't know. But I do know that, for example, in, in uh, your school, the most uh, romantic figure when I was a student was actually not an architect, but an engineer, Chishmijiu. He was <laughs> the most, he was the most artistic person in the school, although he was an engineer. And even he, the way he comb, uh, in fact, uncombed his hair, he was like, a, he was wild, but he was an engineer. I remember when I, <laughs> I was terrible at structures, absolutely terrible, embarrassingly so. So, you know, I was so frightened of the exam. And I, of course, I was not the only one. Many people are frightened by, by the examination at structures. So, you know, they, he gave us the, 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 you know, the subject and uh, I was, uh, I studied, but I, I knew nothing. So I got <laughs> lost. So then, you know, I, 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 uh, he asked us to, to, to grade our own papers. So I, I graded myself, I said zero, uh, smaller or equal to X, meaning the grade, uh, smaller or equal 10. So I placed my grade between zero and 10, an interval. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so when he brought the papers back, he asked me, what did you mean? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you graded your own paper between zero and ten, and I explained to him with a trembling voice. I said, uh, uh, "Professor, uh, you know, from a structural point of view, uh, in terms of rigor, I deserve a zero, obviously. But from a philosophical point of view, and because I, I, I you know, being unable to solve the structure, I begin begin to, you know." Uh, get nuts, so to speak. I, I began to, I forgot exactly what I did, but I think I began to philosophize. So I said, from a philosophical point of view, I think I deserve a 10. And so he wrote a huge file on, <laughs> on we had, a, you know, a, a, you know, a great, uh, you know, little carnet or like how you call it. And he threw it to me. He was, uh, you know, I was far away from him. He threw it through the air you know towards me and i didn't know when he what grade i got i i found out when i i picked it up and, and opened it so yes he was a he was an artist at heart much more than the the architect you know and uh, yeah anyway uh, we had um, on a zoom conference with one of our teachers from concrete and um, um ceramic blocks and uh, other blocks uh, studies uh, structures actually um, when we finished our um, our meeting our um, uh, <laughs> La revedere, uh, Alexandra. La revedere. Ok, cum se spune la Londra? Spui goodbye sau good night sau cum? Ce I guess. Sau cum se spune? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, goodbye. Ok, goodbye, Alexandra. Goodbye. See you, bye.